Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Blockchain Research Webinar organized by the British Blockchain Association. My name is Dr. Naseem Nakwi. I'm the editor in chief of the JBBA. Um, we have a lot to cover in short time. Um, first things first, can you all hear me okay? You can send a thumbs up or? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Very good. Thank you. So, um, what the plan is that uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what the JBBA is and how it is helping blockchain researchers around the globe. We will then have uh, Professor Shukla. He's from India. I'm conscious of the time zone difference and it's um, evening time there. So we will have him first uh, in case if he wants to uh, leave early. We will then go through the topic of top 10 reasons for paper rejection and then some tips and strategies from our uh, editors, uh, Professor Mark Pilkington and Dr. Sean Mannion, followed by some discussion on research dissemination strategies and um, a post-publication um, uh, strategies. So, and in the end, we will have uh, Q and A's. Uh, please feel free to uh, type your questions in the chat box, if you have any. Uh, so you don't have to wait till the end. You can just type your questions as uh, they occur to you. So what is JBBA? JBBA is an open access uh, block search journal. And what that means is that there is no uh, subscription or cost to read the articles that are published in this journal, uh, which means that once you have published a paper here, um, anyone in the world internet access can read the papers for free. Uh, JBBA is a, is a double blind peer reviewed journal, which means that when you have submitted your paper to the journal, authors, uh, uh, the editors and reviewers do not know the identity of the authors and vice versa. So uh, all the author identifiable information is, uh, is removed before the uh, paper is sent to reviewers, which means that your work is assessed purely on the basis of merit and not on prior reputation or affiliation with any institution. Um, the other uh, uh, important point is uh, that because we are an association that publishes this journal, we have uh, a very, uh, very strong industry networks and links. We work very closely with policymakers, governments, businesses, so any research output that is curated at the JBBA, it, it reaches uh, far and wide uh, very quickly and is discussed and debated and it's cited in various policy docs and so on. More on this later. The, the journal is very multidisciplinary. We have published research from economics, philosophy, cryptography, quantum computing, tokenomics. So a wide range of topics related to distributed ledgers um, are, are published in the journal. The journal is indexed in the directory of open access journals. And what is this? So the directory of open access journal is, an, uh, is, a, is a database. It indexes journals uh, based on some very stringent criteria, there are more than um, more than 45, 50 criteria that you have to fulfill before you are eligible for indexing in DOAGE. And uh, uh, for example, digital archiving policy has to be in place, open access policies, and all the various other arrangements. Um, we receive a lot of traffic from DOAGE. 
uh, around 300,000 unique visitors a month um, uh, visits Doage with about 900,000 page views. So uh, very good exposure for our authors. The hard copies, uh, we also print the, the journal, the hard copies of the journal, which means um, they are uh, distributed uh, worldwide uh, across the globe to libraries, uh, businesses, uh, policymakers, government officials, um, and, and obviously, of course, to the authors and their institutions. So this is uh, University of Cambridge, for instance, you can actually go and read the journal there. Physical copy is, is available, uh, as well as in more than 100 other universities around the globe. We also create infographics for the research that is published in the JBBA. Um, a study was done which showed that um, the infographics receives uh, three times more citations page views, article downloads. So this is a, a, another um, a benefit for authors that uh, uh, we uh, provide to our author community. We also um, create video abstracts for our authors. And um, video abstracts, uh, we are the world's first blockchain research journal to do that. and they uh, are quite popular uh, in, again, increases the number of citations, views, downloads uh, of the uh, original paper. And um, it's good for, good to be, you know, for sharing for social media and, uh, and so on. You may be aware of this. Uh, we are uh, also in partnership with the artifacts. We are uh, on the blockchain, which means that the authors um, have this uh, uh, facility to uh, time stamp their articles on the blockchain and also network with other authors that are part of the system. So most of our journal authors, uh, reviewers, editors are already in, the, in this portal. So we have workspaces um, and the author community. Here is a, a screenshot of uh, the back office. So most of them are already here. And one of the advantages is that you, you can cite other people's work and others can also cite your work in real time. So you don't have to um, you know, wait for the traditional uh, citations, that the time lag and the delays. So here is instant, is real time. Um, for example, this paper was uh, uploaded uh, on the blockchain, from consensus on Ethereum, and as you can see, it's already received five citations. These are blockchain-based artifacts uh, citations. This is free to use for uh, our authors, and I would uh, recommend and I would suggest that you uh, take advantage of it. You create an account, and then you will be able to access all the papers that we have published and also interact with the community. Another um, benefit to authors, the service that we offer is uh, Editage, uh, uh, which is um, language editing and translation service for authors that are uh, from non-native English speaking uh, countries. Currently we offer uh, six different languages translation, uh, Chinese, Korean, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, Japanese, and Turkish. Some of the world's um, leading institutions have cited their um, JBBA in their policy documents. Here are some of them. So the research that you publish in the journal is uh, not just an academic paper that's buried in, in thousands of other research papers, but the way uh, JBBA and the organization is positioned. Uh, it it uh, enables uh, authors and their work to be read and used uh, for policy making decisions, setting benchmarks, national guidelines, uh, and other uh, various uh, global objectives.
it's it's important to note that uh, many industries and enterprises are also opting to publish their research in the JBBA, and uh, these are some of the uh, some of the companies and organizations that have uh, a popular blockchain research in the journal. I would encourage you to read these papers. They are all open access. So that's a kind of brief overview of what is JBBA and how we are helping authors uh, achieve greater exposure uh, in helping them showcase their work and also making it more accessible and discoverable for a wider audience. So now I would like to uh, invite Professor Sandeep Shukla uh, to give us some tips on blockchain research in general, but also uh, writing a paper for if you are from a non-native English speaking country and any other advice, any suggestions he has for uh, a blockchain researchers. So over to you, Professor Shukla. Uh, may I uh, share my screen? Yes, of course. Right now, okay. I say it's, uh, it's disabled, so. Uh, hang on, uh, hang on. Uh, can you share it now? No, it still shows disabled. You have to uh, change it to. A okay, I'll I'll make you host, Sandeep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, uh, so I'm gonna uh, uh, do this. Uh, okay. So uh, there we go. So I, I just put together something, uh, you know, uh, very quickly because uh, just to help me, you know, uh, streamline my uh, thoughts. Uh, so uh, what I would, uh, I always tell people that, you know, first find a real world problem. So I often see, so after the blockchain uh, became popular, I see, uh, thousands of papers uh, that come through uh, various uh, forums uh, for, for reviews for in conferences and journals, uh, and even in the uh, review of uh, proposals to funding agencies. And most of them actually has, uh, has the uh, commonality that they are trying to solve a problem that really doesn't exist. So, so in most cases, what happens is that uh, they take uh, blockchain technology and uh, it's like a hammer looking for a nail and then they find something and then they say that, okay, we'll be using blockchain. So, so first thing that one has to do is to identify a problem to solve, which people care about. And for that, what you have to do is to actually talk to the stakeholders of that problem and then talk to the businesses and government agencies who would actually bring changes in the regulation, in the uh, dissemination of uh, the idea and probably implement and market the ideas. And then uh, be, talk to experts and uh, you know, justify to the experts why blockchain is the right tool for solving that problem. So, First thing that, uh, you know, few things that you need to look at is whether your problem really needs decentralization, integrity of the past uh, records, uh, transactions, uh, and uh, uh, integrity of logging mechanism, and tolerance to malicious parties, uh, malicious uh, users, and the most importantly, do you need uh, to have trust of users, because in many systems we are we can assume a trust uh, about uh, of the uh, in mo in most cases we actually vest our trust in the uh, the purveyor of the data or the the uh, uh, the 
system that uh, keeps our transaction data. For example, when we do banking, we actually uh, trust the bank. And, and I think that that's where blockchain could actually bring in transparency and bring in, bring in more trust. But uh, and not all problems require that level of decentralized uh, mechanism of trust. So, so first thing, uh, find the right problem and, and make sure that the, you speak to the right people to ensure that whatever you come up with is going to be used by somebody, if not immediately, but in uh, five years, 10 years down the line, somebody should say, or some people should say that, oh, this is a great idea. Maybe it's time hasn't come or, or it's very difficult to change the legacy systems, but uh, we'll be looking for something like this in the future as things get uh, more and more untrustworthy and um, there is need for creating uh, more trust out of untrusted entities, things like that. Mm. Uh, so, so, so one thing that one has to remember is that just because you took, take a course in blockchain or you know how to write uh, chain code in Hyperledger or uh, you can write smart contracts in Ethereum uh, or you know how to use uh, some other blockchain like Coda or something, that uh, you know, not necessarily all problems can be solved using blockchain technology, especially, you know, uh, the, uh, it may be solved by blockchain technology, but it is probably not required. So under, understanding whether blockchain technology is the best way to go about solving the problem and, and to approach that question honestly, right? Not because you want to write your next paper, but because you want to make an impact. And then consider other alternative solutions and their pros and cons, and try to convince yourself that the other pros and cons and uh, the doing it with blockchain, you know, how they uh, fare against each other. And uh, so it, the problem that you must choose must be a problem that is begging to be solved, not something that is not, you know, solving it or and not solving it doesn't make any difference to anybody. Uh, so it should not be an artificial problem, uh, which is one of the biggest problem, especially out of India uh, academia. I see that there most problems that uh, people uh, come up with, even in uh, funding proposals are artificial problems, uh, mostly because they know the technology, they try to uh, bring the technology to solve an artificial problem. And you have to leave out any problem that is better solved using other technologies like uh, you know, distributed databases, uh, distributed system, plain old cryptographic protocols and uh, things like that. So that, as I said before, that you have to check out the trust assumptions, the security threat models before judging whether blockchain is a suitable technology. And the problem is, uh, or the problem could be about the technology itself. Maybe you are making a fundamental contribution to the blockchain technology itself. That, then, uh, you know, that's a different type of problem. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, so then you have to research the related work very thoroughly, right? So you have to see what is there already and whether that can actually solve the problem at hand. And if it does, then you have to convince yourself that your approach is better uh, in certain parameters in, and you can choose the parameters and you have to make sure those parameters people care about like uh, transaction throughput or uh, scalability or robustness, some, some uh, parameters along which you can claim that your approach will give you better result. And then when you actually do it, you have to actually show that it does indeed uh, give you a better result. So then you have to go into the design of the solution, right? So or the solution approach design. And in my view, the design must be modeled at least semi-formally, if not fully formally mathematically, because uh, the eventually you have to make some claim about the properties of your solution. Like my property ha is scalable or it's scalable up to certain point, or my thing is, is, uh, uh, is safe uh, with respect to one third 
of malicious uh, users or my thing is uh, uh, can provide uh, better uh, throughput transaction throughput than uh, previous systems so these properties unless you kind of uh, model it model the problem and the solution you are un you are you are you won't be expressing it very very uh, you know precisely so what you would, you are going to do is you are going to make a bit around the bush to make the claim and many times the reviewers will not understand what you are what is it that you are claiming what is the novelty that you are claiming so if not a formal proof which most of the cases you wouldn't do you at least give an informal convincing argument that you have your solution achieves the desired properties and what are the desired properties that you set out in your problem statement and when you implement do not invent your own blockchain unless convinced that other existing platforms won't do and then benchmark your implementation for transaction throughput for robustness for scalability and and other parameters and then generate enough experimental evidence of scalability and throughput etc depending on the level required by the application in hand like some application may clearly not require you know uh, tens of thousands of transactions per second and some application may require that right so you depending on what kind of application etc you have to decide what the level of uh, you know scalability what's the level of throughput that you require and you have to somehow experimentally show evidence of that now the other kind of work that we often do is the blockchain technology work like new consensus models or finding uh, malicious uh, nodes in in uh, permissionless blockchains like in ethereum or in bitcoin etc or formal or semi formal verification of smart contracts or network properties of blockchain growth dynamics or new cryptographic methods or inventing application specific blockchain technology like iota right so or coda for example those are application blockchain technology where you bring in a new type facet of the technology so these are the other kind of work where uh, what i earlier said is not exactly applicable because you are here you, you are uh, you know attacking a very different kind of problem in the technology domain itself uh, but these papers are lesser in number than the kind of papers that i was talking about earlier now your writing should be in the progressive style right so progressive in the sense that you know you as if you are uncovering a story right so you explain the problem and convince the reader that the blockchain technology is appropriate and here an illustrative example a realistic realistic but scaled down illustrative example helps convince readers and the reviewers convince why previous work won't suffice and then do problem formulation and and semi formalization if required uh, uh, stake your claims and then you describe your approach and here you make the kind of convincing argument why your claims are are correct and then you have to give some implementation details experimental setup for benchmarking and then you do the experimental results and then you give some examples of where uh, this will fit and how it will fit and if you already have uh, convinced some business or some government agency etc to use it you know this is where you can stake that claim and then you also must mention that what are the limitations and shortcomings uh, for example in terms of uh, throughput in terms of scalability but then you can make argument that you know for the applications that you are worrying about such uh, shortcomings are not really uh, uh, it doesn't really matter and then you do improvements and future work uh, where you describe what you are going to where you go from here and that's the kind of uh, paper writing style that i normally uh, prescribe to my students now for non native speakers uh, one of the biggest problem that we face is that our grammar is often incorrect not because we don't know grammar because because when you are writing in a flow often times certain uh, uh, you know uh, things don't match like uh, the verb forms uh, don't match the uh, number 
of the noun and, and things like that. So it's bet, best to get checked it by somebody who is very good with English, uh, which could be you yourself, uh, which is uh, not uh, ruled out. And then uh, oftentimes I tell students to actually take every sentence and put it on Grammarly and see if the sentence is correct, uh, grammatically correct. Because it's very annoying to read uh, papers which are uh, where every few lines, uh, you know, are you know uh, uh, flowered with uh, grammatical mistakes. But Grammarly and this kind of stuff often actually fail to make semantic check. So oftentimes, if it if it is grammatically correct but semantically makes no sense, Grammarly will not be able to find that. So therefore, you have to still get it read by somebody with good knowledge of English. And uh, then you have to also read the paper several times before you saturate on finding mistakes. And uh, then once you saturate, that is you are not finding any more mistakes, then you get it read by your colleagues, especially non-author colleagues, colleagues who are not author of this paper and take their critique very seriously. And of course, you, know, you, uh, you probably take them out for a round of drinks or, or something. Uh, uh, you know, otherwise don't do it. And then, so, so the point is that the finalizing a paper before submission is like debugging a program and you have to do it very meticulously because oftentimes students just write the first draft and then uh, put it uh, through to the advisor or supervisor or other co-authors. And then there is such a surge of, uh, you know, difficulty in, in debugging it, then, then the, the others give up, give up, it's a, it's a mess. So, so it's, you have to take the ownership of the paper and do the debugging yourself with the help of others and, and other tools. So my final word should be that writing a paper is easy. There are millions written every year, but writing a good and publishable paper is hard work, uh, including the actual work as well as the writing. So, so therefore, we have to learn to be patient and we have to learn to do the due diligence and never start a work with paper writing in mind. Paper writing should be an outcome and not the goal of your work. The goal of your work is to make impact and, and to do something that is useful and do something that is unique and novel. And then if the work is good, then eventually your paper will make it you know, you have to do some debugging, you have to do some writing uh, iterations, maybe a few review iterations, a uh, few rejections, and then rewriting. But eventually it will make it if the work is good. The work is not good, then it's all up to the, your luck and the reviewer and the, and the various other extraneous uh, factor on which you have no control. So I'll, I'll finish here. Uh, and unless there are any questions immediately, or I don't know how Nassim yeah, wants me to uh, do that. Yeah, we'll take questions then. Sandeep, thank you for that. If you give me yeah. the, the host, back, please. <coughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, let me see. Uh, how do I do this? I'll switch back to the BBA, right? Yeah. Uh, done. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Sandeep. Um, so we'll take uh, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through very quickly. The, uh, the top uh, reasons for uh, paper rejection, and then we'll have uh, two more speakers uh, to give their, their thoughts. Um, I think the, 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 the number one reason is lack of clarity, as Sandeep mentioned. Um, if you do not have a clear uh, hypothesis, a clear question, what, ex what exactly is it that you are trying to achieve? then it is likely that the editors uh, won't like it and it would probably get rejected. Um, if you are making any extravagant claims, um, then you have to support them and back with some extraordinary proofs. 
um, otherwise uh, you you have a, a high likelihood of your paper uh, getting rejected lack of novelty i think is another important one um, at the jbba we are not too fussed about that but in some journals uh, uh, they have this uh, policy that your your paper has to be a novel it has to be uh, uh, a new idea a new uh, a unique uh, uh, perspective or problem uh, or topic um, plagiarism i would say is another big one um, we don't get that many papers that are plagiarized but it's important to to note that uh, if your paper is uh, has any hint of plagiarism then not only it will get rejected straight away before it even goes to the reviewers because we carry out these checks uh, before sending the paper to our reviewers uh, but there's also possibility that you'll get uh, blacklisted from any future submissions to the journal another important thing is lack of um, supporting evidence uh, sometimes authors forget to mention or cite the work of others so as you have written something which is a uh, which is a, a a statement a fact or a point you want to make then you have to back it up with why you are saying it and uh, cite the reference um, it's important that the, uh, the the papers that you submit are are research papers and not not blog posts or or, or, or just opinion type articles. Um, they, they has to have a structure, uh, a hypothesis, a methodology, results, why you conducted that research, what are the conclusions. It has to have a, an abstract explaining what the research sets out to do. Um, please do not submit if your paper is already under review at another journal um it's important that you submit your paper to one journal and wait for the outcome and as sandeep mentioned if your paper is incomprehensible if it is full of jargons full of abbreviations uh if there's poor flow uh technical style is not correct uh if you have uh, tables or diagrams that are missing or missing the, the numbers then uh it is likely Paper is either going to be rejected or will be uh, sent back to you asking for a revision. So here are some uh, some some of the top reasons for uh, for paper rejection. I'm going to uh, ask uh, Professor Mark Plickington now. Mark, are you here? Yes. So I'm switching on the uh, camera. Can you hear me well? I'm... Yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah, um, yes. yes. I'm. I'm. I'm very thankful for this uh, invitation, uh, Dr. Nassim, and uh, for the uh, uh, wonderful uh, webinars that are being uh, organized on a regular basis by the uh, British Blockchain Association. So I will keep my intervention uh, relatively short because there are some very valid points which have been made uh, already by uh, Professor Sandeep and by Dr. Nassim. Uh, I think I was asked uh, the question of, you know, the expectations of uh, 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 reviewers, you know, when you're submitting a research paper to GBBA, uh, what is it exactly that we are uh, expecting from a, you know, suitable research paper, which might, you know, be uh, a, a, a become uh, eligible for uh, publication. And there are so many different types of papers of research or thinking about this ahead of the webinar. I was thinking about an answer that would uh, be suitable for all types of uh, research, blockchain research, and that could apply. And uh, the best way I found to answer that question of the, you know, the, 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 the expectations of, uh, of the reviewers is in fact is a, a metaphor. And I'm going to use a geographical metaphor, which is the following. So think about blockchain research as a country, a landscape but a country which hasn't got fixed borders. So like moving or uh, floatable borders, if you will. And the reason why these borders of this you know, fictitious country uh, are not fixed is because it hasn't, yet be, uh, it hasn't yet been fully explored. So your mission as a researcher is to help us go into, move into uncharted uh, territory and try to expand to push back 
the boundaries of this country called uh, blockchain research. So by doing so, you're going to push back the boundaries of uh, knowledge. Of you're going to expand uh, scientific uh, knowledge, and this is precisely what we want. Now, there's another very many different points, very valid points, which have been made. I'm very sensitive to the. Uh, to the, to, to, to the idea that you need to have a, a research, a well-defined uh, research question and that you're trying to uh, solve a real world problem, which takes me to the issue of the usefulness of uh, research, of your research. So I always uh, think that, you know, when I think about blockchain, when I think about blockchain research, is that we live in a world which is characterized by a number of uh, social and economic structures which are sometimes uh, quite complex and the whole idea behind blockchain research i think is uh, do can we can we solve uh, existing problems or can we improve the functioning of these social and economic structures in a way that is positive, that is forward-looking, that is that a way that is uh, useful for, for for the community. So uh, I'm very sensitive to this idea that your research also has to be uh, useful. Now, of course, when I was talking about the map, once you have found uh, yourself in uncharted uh, territory, you're not just not going to draw or paint what is around you. You're going to have to state or you're going to have to uh, account for what you uh, see, observe in a way that meets a number of scientific and uh, technical requirements. So if you want to pursue and finish the metaphor here, you're going to draw a map, but this is a map that's going to be a professional map. So it's going to have to meet a number, uh, a number of requirements, as I said, the technical and scientific. And remember, in the end, GBBA is going to be read by uh, decision policymakers, people working for NGOs, people uh, working uh, in the field of public policy. And so they, they, they have time to spend on your research, but they have limited time. So you have to go to, to the point and you have to be decisive and uh, you have to be interesting. So think about the people who are going to read your research. So as um, I think uh, um, Sandeep, Professor Sandeep said, um, writing a research paper is a lot of work. You know, so you have to be ready to spend a lot of time, effort, devotion, I would say even passion, put some passion into your work. And then if all these conditions are met, I think, yes, you, you stand a chance for, you know, to get published. So it's a long uh, uh, journey, but, you know, uh, with uh, willpower, hard work, devotion, good understanding of the requirements, I think is a possibility for uh, very motivated uh, researchers to, to get published by uh, GBB, GBBA. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, there were some uh, insights that I have shared with you. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Very much. Yes. Thank yes. you, Mark. Thank you for that. So, um, next we have Dr. Sean Mannion, who is our review editor for WBB. Sean, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, hello, Sean. Yes. Hello. Right. Okay. So, Sean, uh, top, top tips for writing a world class paper. Certainly. And, and I will share my screen. I would love to put up your. Um, uh, I, I'm not a host, so I'm not able to share, but if you can give me that, I would love to be able to put up uh, your pyramid. And I think we've, we've already heard a great number of, of details that I think cover this, this realm. So I want to step back a little bit and then we'll dive into some specifics. Um, but now I am the host, so let me share uh, this. Sure. Okay. And this is, uh, this is Dr. Nakvi's published um, uh, illustration of um, what's a quality of evidence pyramid. And it's sort of a, an expansion on um, the scientific uh, pyramid of evidence. Um, really, I think, necessary for blockchain to delve much deeper into, into the root of a lot of what's out there in information. Um, I, did a, I did an advisory um, role for a US uh, Health and Human Services project last year. And it seemed only 10% of the um, uh, blockchain work that had been applied to, in this case, opioid research, um, had been uh, peer reviewed. 
So most of what's out there is really at the lower end of the pyramid right now. And I think it's important when you think about publishing to understand what it is you're trying to do. And you're trying to take an idea that's already been vetted, tested, you've bounced it around to your colleagues, you've talked to other people, you've run experimental tests on it, maybe you wanted to see the speed of transactions um, for one platform versus another, there's a lot of different things you could do. But that idea has already been tested in a way. And to move things into the peer review, to move into research articles and scholarly, uh, scholarly journals like JBBA, you want to have things that are on the upper end of this pyramid. Um, but, but ideas start small and ideas grow. And I think we're still in the nascent stage of, of blockchain. So my background is in neuroscience and in, in 25 years in, in neuroscience, there's a, there's a lot deeper of a root in what's already established within the literature. So oftentimes you don't even take note of those smaller things except in your small cell until it gets to this level. Whereas in blockchain, I think we're paying attention to a lot more stuff down here. But the thing is, you need to get it up here if it's to be part of the accepted consensus permanent record of, of, of blockchain and blockchain research. Um, so, so what is it you wanna do when you wanna publish? You wanna take your idea and you wanna put it out to the world, but not in the way of a, a white paper or an advertisement, just sort of a small telling of what you wanna to do to get people to pay attention. That's, that's much more down here. You wanna put it out there, and I'll, I'll be honest, you wanna put that out there to make it stronger to have it critiqued, to have it criticized, and then refined in a way that makes it a permanent part of, of, of what's sort of the wall of knowledge that is being built. Um, my, my doctoral advisor um, told me something that stays with me, um, which is when you put, put an idea out there in, in science or in research, think of it like a sword that you are forging and that, that you want that to be hammered. And the more times it is hammered, the more honed it is, the sharper the blade, the stronger the blade. And that's what you want to do with your ideas. And so the idea that you want to put something into a journal like, like JBBA is really to take it and hone it within your own circle first and then put it to the reviewers, put it to the reviewers to be able to make it even better. Don't be shy and don't feel like criticism is something that you can't take. You want to make it stronger with their criticism. And then that refinement goes into the public record. And even there, you will find there will be critique, but that is good too, because people pay, are paying attention to your ideas. And then oftentimes you can advance your ideas even further and maybe in other publications, um, or other people will take them and run with them. And that's another idea that I think you need to be, keep in mind when you're thinking about publications, is that you wanna be able to have replicability. You wanna be able to tell somebody what you did in such detail that they could go and do the same thing and get the same result. If I'm gonna go out there and say, well, Bitcoin is so much faster than Ethereum because I think so, that's not really gonna be the case. And everyone really kind of knows that that's not, not the case. The speed of transactions is something that's, um, you know, you can be tested. So if I test what type of transaction I did here and what type of transaction I did here on two different platforms, I wanna describe in detail what time of day I did it what type of transaction, what are the different elements that went into it, so that if someone else repeats that same thing, they find the same result. That replicability is something very important in research because it shows that you are getting um, a result that is true and not just a random chance. And that's where you get into some of the observational case studies. Well, I saw that this happened, so I could write a paper on that. There are some value in doing that. It's not that it's not valuable, but it's really just the start of the conversation in research studies. Moving on to an interventional case study where you have a small testing amount, a small N as they call it, and you are intervening in some way to do some comparison. Well, we did this with this platform and we did this with this platform and this was our result. Well, we only tried it once. We didn't try it at different times of day. We didn't try it you know, at different types of, times of year when volume may vary. Original research is really when you start to get into the meat of what goes into um, uh, scientific or academic or, or um, uh, research publishing. And I, I use these terms interchangeably because in different fields, they use different terminology. But original research is really what, 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 uh, what Dr. Nakvi and others have laid out, which is you're putting down, you're putting down a hypothesis, you're testing that hypothesis, you're telling people what you did methodologically, you're telling them in an introduction why you did this, why was it important, what was the background and the context, and we'll get to that in a minute, because I think that's very important. And then you're gonna tell them what the results of that were, 
And then you're going to describe those results and what you interpret those as meaning. And there is an interpretation there that someone else may differ, but you did the work and you can tell people how you interpret that to be. And then you can you know, draw a conclusion, which is, well, this is what this means. Or maybe this is the recommendations we would give. You know, Based on what we found comparing these two platforms, we would use platform A for this type of activity, but we would recommend platform B for this other type of activity. That recommendation usually falls in that conclusion area. And oftentimes it's suggestions of future research, maybe research you would do yourself, or that somebody else could do. And that way it becomes a building block or a stepping stone. And, and, and I think the um, point I wanted to jump back to is that an introduction, and you heard some of the other, my other colleagues talk about the, you know, the originality or the novelty of the research. It's not that every idea needs to be completely novel, but it needs to add something new to the realm of what you're being discussed. You wouldn't publish the same paper repeatedly because it's just telling people the same thing again and again, nor would you publish an identical paper to somebody else unless you were trying to replicate what they did, which that's a novelty in itself. But there should be some layer of that, but there also needs to be a layer of context. There needs to be a layer of what came before. And here I think in the blockchain world and in some of the papers I've seen, um, you, 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 you may have the biggest misconception um, the idea of, of a white paper in, in its current form is oftentimes a little bit more like a pitch deck. It's really telling the key details, but trying to promote yourself in a way. Scientific or academic, uh, academic publishing is, is promotional in its own right, but it shouldn't be overtly, hey, this is what we did and it's so much better than everything else. You let the data speak for itself. And then part of doing that is to tell what came before. If you ignore what, what happened prior in that same field. I do blockchain in healthcare, blockchain for science. If I'm ignoring what else is going on in blockchain for science, that's actually a detriment to my paper. And if I, as a reviewer, see that and I know about something else going on in that realm, I'm going to share that with the person so they can incorporate it because you don't want a paper that pretends something is new when there's 10 other opportunities, there's 10 other groups doing something like that. Now, it does get challenging because sometimes this this data is only available down in these um, unpublished areas and they're not, they're not indexed and they're not searchable. So it gets a little challenging. But if someone has published on some sort of work and then you're publishing in that same realm, you wanna reference them. Not only does it give credit where credit is due and you want the same people to do, do that for you, but it also helps you build the case for the foundation of your work. If I'm trying to say, hey, this is an important area Here's 10 other projects that have gone on in their results. Here's this different thing we did in this same area. It makes it stronger and I'm standing on the shoulders of those who, who came before. That's a value in this world. It's not, um, it's not, an, it's not, it's not an, ad, an ad campaign. Those have their own roles in, in other places and you can go down to Twitter and you know, read ads all over the place, but, but those aren't as valuable for information. They're for influence, they're for selling. What you're doing up here, what you're doing in the top of the pyramid is to really promote an idea for the purpose and the value of advancing knowledge about the subject, in this case, blockchain. Um, the, last, the last statement I'll make, and then, and then we can jump to questions in the closing minutes here, is this is a really refined area up here, meta-analysis and systematic review. Um, you know, right now during COVID, I spend a lot of time seeing what's going on in, in, in different areas of health. Um, you know, original research is great, but it's just one data point oftentimes. A research paper is going to carry the bias of the author, the bias of the methodology, the bias of the reviewer. Nothing is perfect. And so systematic reviews and uh, meta-analysis start to occur when you have a volume of evidence and people are able to bring those together and look at them systematically to ask questions of the, the research that is out there or to really even sometimes be able to combine the data when that's possible to do these meta-analysis. I don't think we're there yet with um, blockchain research, but we will get there and we'll get there with, with groups like JBBA um, to, to help to bring the forum for this type of formatted data together. Because when you're able to do this, instead of saying, ah, you know, go back to COVID, you know, here's a study that says drug X does this. And then another study comes out and says drug X doesn't do this. And everyone, you know, in the news throws their hands up. Oh my goodness, science is so confusing. No, science is not confusing. Science moves slowly and science moves methodically. And as these original research data points collect, these much more advanced data points, these much more systematic data points are then available. And as we do put together a lot of original research for 
for blockchain, blockchain and transportation, blockchain and supply chain, blockchain and science, blockchain and healthcare, we'll then be able to pull together some of these studies and start to do systematic reviews. And that's where you get a lot more attention by the outside the blockchain world, that you're doing things in a regimented, systematic way that, that are believable and that will ultimately move the whole industry forward. So with that, I'll stop and uh, jump, to, uh, jump to Dr. Nafi and, and perhaps we can take questions or, or have some dialogue. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you, excellent. Uh, if you could give me the control back, please, the host. Um, Yes. Uh, remind me where I give control back. I've I've forgotten that one. So if you just uh, it's if you go to BBA and say give control back, host make host. Um, under under which one participant? Yeah, you go to participants uh -huh. and then then select BBA. Uh, there is a blue thing that will come up. More. More right. Make host. Perfect. Got it. Thank you. I always forget the little things. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, let me just... Okay, so, um, yeah, that was excellent, Sean. Thank you. Uh, um, I wanted to um, just spend a couple of minutes because both you and Mark are here. Uh, guys, this is uh, Dr. Sean Menian and Mark Pilkington at uh, our scientific conference earlier this year in Edinburgh. Um, and we, uh, we, we host these conferences once a year. And um, this is uh, uh, one of the speakers from India, Professor Sham Sundar from IIT Bombay presenting his research. So I just wanted to, uh, and what, what you see on the screen is basically, uh, they are judging the abstracts. So the people who are presenting their research, um, uh, they are basically evaluated and the judges ask a couple of questions uh, just to clarify if they, if they have questions. So you basically submit your abstract and then your, your full presentation. And uh, if your paper is, is accepted, then uh, you come to our conference and then the abstracts are uh, uh, presented in the form of a, a, a presentation about five, five to 10 minutes long. So um, Mark, if, uh, if you're here, I, I wanted to just get your views, uh, just a, a few points on uh, authors that are uh, planning to uh, submit uh, their work, their abstracts to the uh, International Scientific Conference uh, any tips or suggestions for them? Yeah. Sean? Yeah. Um, Sean, shall I start or shall um, Nassim? Please, please yeah. go ahead. Okay. No, no, uh, yeah, I said the, I've, 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 I've had the uh, immense pleasure to attend the first uh, two uh, editions of these international scientific uh, conferences in, in London and in Scotland in Denver last year. And I was very, very impressed by the uh, quality of the presentation and the speakers. And if you want to get involved in blockchain research today, I think it's a fantastic starting point to start with the uh, International Scientific Conference. So this year, I think uh, Dr. Nassim is going to explain to you that we're going to have an online uh, edition because of the, uh, the circumstances with the pandemic. But it's a fantastic idea for you to, to, to submit your work, uh, your abstract to, uh, to this uh, conference, because you will have uh, a, 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 an unprecedented uh, opportunity to interact with uh, fellow researchers, so to engage in some kind of, you know, uh, research uh, discussion, scientific discussions with some uh, fellow uh, researchers like yourself. And, you know, again, a lot of uh, from these exchanges so yes, I would definitely encourage you to submit your research and then you will get some feedback. You will get some initial feedback from the, the, the reviewers, from the, uh, the participants of the conference, and this will help you uh, improve your research and then progressively move towards a publishable paper. 
which is uh, something a lot of um, you know people who got published by GGBA have done. They have followed this path. First, they have uh, submitted an abstract to you know the conference. Then they presented their work. They got some feedback, some interesting discussions, and then they continue to expand, elaborate on their paper. And then six months, one year later, they finally uh, got published by GBBA. So you think you see it's an incremental process, step by step. You move along the uh, scientific uh, ladder, if uh, if I may. So yes, it's a definitely a great opportunity, and I encourage uh, young uh, researchers or you know all researchers to uh, to go uh, 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 um, to follow this, uh, go down this this uh, venue because I think it's it's very uh, productive and very uh, very interesting for. For researchers to um, to try uh, to try your luck and to get involved in these uh, conferences. Thank you, Mark. Sean, any comments? Um, yes, to, to, to add on to that, definitely, I would encourage people, um, especially with uh, you know the the nature of it being virtual this year. It's a, it's it's a it's a very easy way to to start to get your foot into um, you know getting getting involved in these types of events and 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 looking at research publication. Um, and and the, the the tradition of professional societies, which which uh, British Blockchain Association is is modeled after, and and uh, really has done very very well, and I think is is unique in the blockchain world. Um, scientific conferences are the greatest way to start to get feedback. And and if you think about the progression, you know, as I was saying, you you want the you want the hammering to happen to your blade so it can be as sharp as possible. And you start with you your own small group, and, and I would encourage people to to talk to people that they know and colleagues and mentors. But then by presenting at a conference, you start to get that feedback that comes, um, you know, from the reviewers and the judges, from other people who are involved, who 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 talk to you or follow up and contact you afterwards. And then that's further refining for being prepared to submit something for. For, for really the permanent record of, of blockchain science, if you think about it. And, and that's, that's what you want to do is go through that progression and you'll learn something along every step of the way. And as you get comfortable with it, like I had said, you know, some people find being critiqued or having their ideas, um, you know, chopped at to be uncomfortable. But really, uh, one of the best things to do is get comfortable with that because then you're really making every idea you have stronger by incorporating the, 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 the consensus of this crowd. And isn't that what we're, we're, we're to do in blockchain is to really have that consensus or, or, or that value demonstrated by a crowd rather than just sort of individual experts. And I, I think this is a great way to do it. Um, you know, I would, I, would, I would say as one other tip that maybe didn't come up, um, you know, being honest with, with how you present things is very important. Um, mentioning limitations, mentioning not shortcomings, but hey, we covered A, B, but we didn't cover C, D, or E. And being able to tell people that you didn't cover C, D, and E, but then here's what people can do in the future is actually another value without having to do the whole alphabet yourself. So being honest with your writing um, and being honest with your presentation, here's what we did, but here's what we didn't do. It's, it's, it's perfectly acceptable. And that's, that's the way that um, you get to present ideas in this forum. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Excellent. I agree completely. Um, so in the last uh, few minutes, if you have no more questions, I just want to quickly go through the uh, search dissemination and the, the social media and the impact and also post publications strategies. So there's an, there's an article I shared uh, also last night uh, it's on the JBBA uh, uh, blockchain research dissemination. So the different strategies that you can use um, to uh, make sure that once your work is published, it actually reaches wider audience. Uh, people read it, people talk about it. And I think it's very important. And one of the things that uh, I am very keen on recently, and, and I think it's quite useful, uh, uh, especially with the... Um, with the, with the social media and the, uh, the, the various different discussions going around, uh, this thing called alt metric. And um, it's, it's also called alternative metrics. And basically it's uh, anything that is not the traditional citation in an academic journal. So who is talking about your research? So that's important. Um, uh, is your paper quoted by the policy makers? Uh, is your work cited by decision makers? Uh, is your work been used uh, for uh, to set national benchmarks, uh, frameworks, and, and also who is talking about it? Uh, and one of the, uh, so we are uh, on Pablons, which allows us to uh, look at the different uh, 
uh, uh, levels of uh, attention and reach that your work is getting. And I would recommend that you also uh, have an account on Publons, it's free. And you, you will see who is, uh, who's talking about your work. So uh, it's actually quite detailed uh, on, on Altmetric. So for example, if your paper has been cited in, in a news uh, or, or a blog or a policy document or Twitter, then you will see all of that uh, on here. And it gives you an idea of uh, who is who is actually uh, talking about your work and what impact it's been uh, having. Also, I think uh, as discussed before, please try and use all the possible venues for um, uh, dissemination of your work. So create an account on Google Scholar, on, on Artifacts, on Scopus. These are all free. Uh, make sure that if you are a university student, if you've published your work, it's in your institutional repository, uh, on, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, uh, Research, Gate, SSR, Microsoft Academic. These are all, and, and I'm sure there are many more. So to try and uh, uh, get your work uh, on as many venues as possible uh, so that it reaches uh, the wider audience. Uh, our publishing consultant, John Bond, has a channel with a lot of very useful uh, short videos, uh, very bite-sized uh, on how to, how to write a general abstract and how to the various, various other uh, videos on, on various different topics related to scholarly publishing. Uh, so I would, I would recommend that you uh, use them. Okay, uh, any questions before we conclude? Please type in the chat box if you have any. Nassim, uh, uh, I saw- yes, indeed, yeah. I saw a question early uh, uh, on the chat box and I, I want to uh, address that. Uh, the question was, uh, uh, could cryptocurrency reduce social injustice and expand financial inclusion? And how open source technologies like blockchain could overcome COVID-19 crisis? So I think, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that cryptocurrency will reduce social justice. Our research shows that 90% of the money in cryptocurrency is in 100 accounts only uh, 90 per, and the same with the Ethereum. Uh, I, the numbers may vary a little bit, but it's uh, much more inequality in cryptocurrency than in real world. So I don't see how cryptocurrency will uh, uh, reduce social injustice or financial inclusion. It can give you transparency, however, and uh, uh, the currently the transparency is uh, not an issue uh, the, because we can analyze which accounts has how much money and where they are getting the money from all that information we can get so but since there is no regulation we cannot do anything about it or or it may be not even worth doing anything because right now it's actually uh, investors who mostly are using those platforms if it becomes mainstream, then maybe those information can be useful in putting regulations and stuff. But I don't see that. I don't see that that technology is the solution to social injustice and financial inclusion. Technology cannot solve human problems like that. So I think uh, same thing with COVID nineteen. I have a big problem in India. There are millions of papers are being written in COVID-19, which are absolute junk. And uh, uh, not necessarily on blockchain, but you know, lots of papers. So let's not try to solve a problem that needs a very, very involved solution, including, um, you know, uh, political will and including uh, various uh, uh, participation of various different uh, uh, members of the society, regulators and scientists and medical professionals and, and law enforcement and so on. 
technology cannot solve everything. So I think that's something that I wanted to tell the audience that don't think that technology is a panacea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think it's how we use the technology that uh, that that's what uh, matters. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I think uh, if we have, uh, if we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank uh, our uh, uh, guests, Professor Sandeep Shukla, Dr. Sean Menian, and uh, Professor Mark Pilkington. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, for certificates, please uh, email uh, editorial at thejbba.com. And uh, we hope to see you soon. And if you have any questions about uh, submitting your work to the journal or to our international scientific conference. The deadline for submissions is uh, in November, 15th of November, and we have already received some very good abstracts. So uh, please do submit and it's online. So you don't need to travel. You can present your sub abstract from the comfort of your own home this year. The conference is going to be held on the 15th of March. Uh, so you have some time to write your abstracts. At this stage, we are just looking for the abstract and then after that, you can write your full paper and then submit it. Uh, for that, the deadline is a a end of December. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining. And uh, uh, goodbye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.